Have you heard this saying where there's life, there's hope? <laughs> like many sayings, there's a little bit of truth to it, but there's no guarantee of certainty. It's not the fact of life that determines hope, but rather it's the faith of life that determines hope. As Christians, we have a living hope because we have a living God. For the next seven weeks, we're going to be walking through 1 Peter and a series we're calling A Living Hope. 1 Peter is a relatively short letter, but it touches on many aspects of Christian living and principles that define a follower of Jesus. Before we get into Peter's letter, here are a few things we know about Peter. He was one of the first disciples that Jesus called. He always seemed to stand out among the disciples. Sometimes it was for good reasons, other times it was for bad reasons. But it was always hard to miss Peter. In fact, he begins this letter by saying, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. So that's all he says. He probably felt he didn't need to identify himself any more than that because probably he probably realized that most every Christian in the early church pretty much knew who Peter was. Peter was the one who was willing to get out of the boat and walk on the water to Jesus. Peter was the one who confessed that Jesus was the Christ. But Peter was also the one who denied Jesus three times. Peter was described as brash, abrasive, uneducated, and impulsive. Peter writes this letter from the perspective of a follower of Jesus who's reflecting on his earlier days in ministry with Jesus. In which he followed Jesus, he went on road trips, ate meals with him, Listen to his stories and his teachings. He lived in community with Jesus. As we get into this letter, I think it's important for us to understand that the conclusions he wrote about in this letter, they didn't come easy for him. We know that reading through the Gospels that there were many times that Peter just didn't get it. Many times he was confused, even if he didn't want to admit it. But here he is writing a letter to other Christians who are struggling with living a life following Jesus while enduring persecution and, and suffering. By the time he writes this letter, Peter's finally came to the conclusion in his life that Jesus is the living hope, not only for himself, but for all that call on his name. Peter also believes that through the power of the Holy Spirit, this living hope lives in us and works through us. You know, if any of us were to think back over our lives, there'd be some good and there'd be some not so good. I saw a guy with a t-shirt the other day that said, the older I get, the better I was. You know, Peter had a lot of great moments. I mean, after all, he was Jesus' guy. He was in the inner circle. He experienced some incredible moments with Jesus. He listened to Jesus teach and, and witnessed his miracles firsthand. He not only heard the parables, but also had a chance to ask Jesus to explain them to him and to share the message behind the story, what the message really was. Peter was in the front row for the Sermon on the Mount, the most incredible, famous teaching we have from Jesus. But he also had some not-so-great moments. He had moments where he failed Jesus in ways he never dreamed possible. Peter writes this letter from that perspective, sharing things that he learned from Jesus. If you know me very well, you've heard me talk about what an incredible relationship I had with my dad. I learned so many things from my dad. I grew up on a farm working alongside him. About the only time I wasn't with my dad growing up was when I was in school. But he taught me what it meant to be a man, to be humble and to be gentle. He taught me how to work hard and to work smart. He taught me how to respect and treat others. If I were to write you a letter, you would hear echoes of my dad in that letter. You just would. The same is true of Peter. As we walk through this letter, you will hear echoes of Jesus Christ's teaching all the way through this letter. In Matthew 16, 13 through 20, we read that Jesus asked his disciples, who do you think that I am? And Peter says that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God. I mean, wow, Peter really gets it. He really does. You know, I've been a Christian for 47 years. I've been serving in full-time ministry for over 25 years at the same church. I've known and served God a long time, but there are times that I still don't get it. I think I get it. I think I've got the living, the Christian living thing figured out. I think I got it all down, but I got to be honest, there are times when I don't get it at all. Much like we know that Peter didn't always get it. Even though he claimed to know that Jesus was the Christ, just a couple of verses later, Peter actually rebukes Jesus and says that Jesus would not suffer and he would not die at the hands of the elders and the chief priests and teachers of the law. To which, as we know, Jesus calls Peter Satan and says, Get behind me, Satan. 
Can you imagine being called Satan by Jesus? I mean, your best friend, your rabbi? Years ago, when I first met Pastor Dudley back in Iowa, he used to call me and my best friend. He'd call us the devil and his friend. Well, you see, we were saved, but we were still a little bit honorary. Pastor Dudley calling you the devil and Jesus calling you Satan are two totally different things. One I laugh about, one I cry about. The last few days I've worked on this lesson, I've come to think that there are probably times thinking back in my life where Jesus may have said the same thing to me as he said to Peter. Times when my faith was lacking, my growth was stagnant, my fear and insecurities led me away from the path that God had intended for me. Times in my life where I was more worried about what others thought about me than what Jesus thought about me. I know in my head what I should do, but the sin in my heart was blinding me to the bigger perspective of God's story. Times in my life where I thought, Jesus, don't come back right now. Give me about two hours. <laughs> I can almost hear Jesus saying, get behind me, Satan. You know, we know from Peter's story that he struggled with the concepts of who Jesus really was and what it meant in Peter's life to follow the Christ, the Son of the living God. We find that he really struggled until one Sunday morning when Peter encountered an empty tomb. We all know that Jesus was beaten and nailed to a cross and eventually crucified. Then he was put into a tomb and three days later after he was placed there, some women who had followed Jesus went to visit the tomb and mourn the loss of their Lord. But they found the tomb empty and they ran to tell the disciples that Jesus' body was gone. Peter was one of the first to view the empty tomb. And even then, he still did not know what it meant. He didn't grasp the concept of Jesus' resurrection right away. Jesus appeared to Peter and to the others after that. And their eyes were suddenly opened and their minds began to understand. They finally understood the power of Jesus. We read in Acts that Jesus continued teaching Peter and the others until he finally ascended into heaven. He told them once again that the Holy Spirit was coming to them if they should wait we know that Peter was waiting with the others, praying and expecting God to show up. The Bible says that when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. And suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each one of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Then we know that Peter went out and preached this amazing sermon and 3,000 people came to know the love and grace of Jesus that day. You know, everything didn't happen overnight in Peter's life. It took years before he was in a place to write this letter. We're, we're not that different from Peter in many ways. It has taken us years to get to the point we are with God. But we should never feel like we've arrived. Never stop letting God work on us. Never stop opening ourselves up to God in line with searches as David did over and over and over again in the Psalms. You know, Peter talks about the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit in chapter 1 and 2 of this letter. That word means to make holy, to make pure from sin, to set apart for God as sacred. Sanctification is not something that happens overnight, it happens right away or an instant. It's not something that happens the moment you're baptized. It's not something that if we try hard enough that we can do ourselves. Sanctification is the work that is done by the Holy Spirit in our hearts and in our minds. Sanctification happens over time as we spend time with God, as we read and study His Word, as we quiet ourselves, as we worship Him, as we have community with other believers, as we let go of things that keep us from growing in Christ, and, and as we put ourselves in a position to truly hear from God. But we have to be in a place where God can work in us. I'll never forget years ago when everyone was still using a AOL, Remember that voice? You got mail. <laughs> it, it was so exciting. Uh, I remember there was also these instant messages that would pop up from friends. It was so cool back then. It's kind of annoying today. But anyways, one night I was on my computer and I, I clicked on an email. And in an instant, a website opened with a picture of something I, I should have never glanced at, let alone stared at or looked at for any length of time. I remember thinking in my head, I should not be looking at this, but there was, was something I was looking at. And just in that moment, in that instant, a message came up. An instant message popped up from Rick Gaisel, and it said, Tim, always be in a place where God can use you. Bam! As I reflect back on my many years as a Christian, as a pastor, I've experienced some amazing things with God. I mean, amazing things. I've seen him do some miraculous things in my life, around my life, through my life. Just a few weeks ago, the staff threw me a surprise 25-year ministry anniversary party. 
It was kind of like being at your own funeral, but being alive. It was really cool. Seeing what God had done in my life. And, you know, I've learned so many things, and yet I still at times struggle. I still have times of darkness and embarrassment. Like Peter, I know that Jesus is my living hope, and I, I know that God has done some really good work in me, and I, and I know that he'll be faithful to complete it. I know he's not done with me, and he's not done with you either. Peter was proof that an uneducated and ordinary man could be used in mighty ways by God. The failures and the struggles that Peter went through give me hope, and they should give you hope, that our failures and our struggles can be used by God to strengthen us and to help others in their journey with God as they become the men and women that God originally created them to be. You know, as believers, we have the Holy Spirit living inside of us. His sanctified work is ready to produce the fruit we're intended to bear. The living hope of Jesus Christ resides within us, and it's our job to let it shine just as Peter did, not just for our sake, but for the sake of the others as well. Reflecting back on our lives is not always fun, and it's not always easy, and it probably wasn't for Peter either. But as we go down the road of life with Jesus, our hope is in him, and it's strengthened and renewed as we see where God has brought us from and where he's leading us to. I think many of us can relate to Peter. Not that we've denied our faith, but we've failed God in ways we never dreamed we would. You may be in a season in your life where everything is a struggle. You may feel shame and regret because of things you've done. But Peter reminds us that God we serve is merciful, the God we serve is alive, the God we serve is promised and inheritance that will never, ever fade away. And that's why we are people of hope. Peter reminds us the resurrection of Jesus gives us hope, a living hope. Peter reminds us as Christ followers, the spirit of the living God is in us. Peter reminds us that Jesus invites everyone into a relationship with him. If Peter were here today and I were to ask him, what is the reason for his hope? I think he would give us a one word answer. The one word would be resurrection. You see, Peter saw Jesus die. Then Jesus appeared before him, and later he had breakfast with him on the beach. Peter's hope was anchored in that one single event. And like Peter, we have hope because Jesus died and he rose again. He resurrected. We have hope because the spirit of the living God is living inside of us. I may not be able to explain everything about the Christian life, but I'm convinced of this. Jesus resurrected. <laughs>